I think we're not winning because we don't respect working people. Like you've got to have like a JD, no kids, a trust fund. There are people who are out there every day working on quality of life issues where they are. We need to find the people who have that clinical condition of public service and are of service. And it shouldn't just be people who can raise a lot of money from their contacts. I just think too many people come here and they follow too much of the advice that's being thrown at them from like the political machine rather than just trusting what they already know about themselves and about their communities. Today I'm talking to three members of Congress, Jared Golden, Mary Peltola, and Marie Glushen Perez. I wanted to pull them into a conversation for a specific reason. These are three members of Congress who have won in Trump districts. They've managed to do something that only five House Democrats have done, win in Republican-held areas. There's a lot to learn from these three individuals. You're not going to agree with everything they say. I don't agree with everything they say. But there's a lot of lessons to be learned about people who are successfully persuading and winning voters who largely disagree with them on some areas. And if the Democratic Party is going to grow, if it's going to win in places like the South and the central part of this country, places we haven't been able to hold House seats, we've got to win in the way that these three individuals have been winning. So with that, I wanted to try to glean some of the most important lessons they have to tell us about how to win in Republican districts. So I'll start with the icebreaker here for us all. If I pulled together 100 people from your district, imagine at random, 100 people from your district, and I put them in a room, and I asked each one of you, please go in and address this congregation of people, and you know nothing about them. What are you gonna go talk about and why? I'll start. Fish, family, and freedom. It, it really resonates with Alaskans. We all depend on fish, whether that's salmon or halibut or herring or crab. Our state is, our identity is very tied to fishing and it really impacts each household's food security. So um, I would definitely talk about fish. I would definitely talk about families and quality of life issues, um, health, um, access to health, access to food, uh, grocery stores, for instance. Um, schools and and lastly I would talk about freedom and how important it is for Alaskans and Americans to maintain our freedom and and specifically uh, women's reproductive rights uh, right to repair I think antitrust is like the fight of my generation and I think it's something that every small business owner like every tradesperson everybody that like changes their own oil that cares deeply about and I think that, um, I don't know, without the sort of economic freedom that comes from real competitive access, like you don't, that's like the undergirding of a lot of these like bigger values that we share. Yeah, I think I um, really stress to folks back home um, that I think the job is about putting them, putting Maine uh, first above all else. I sense that each one of you made a judgment around going local, that was clear all that each of you thought about. It. And then to the degree that you want to lean policy-wise, I, I sense you know, there's economic freedom and just generally freedom of uh, health, freedom of being. And uh, maybe we'll, we'll turn to one thing that you didn't, any of you say, which was the T word, Trump. Is there a reason, like if, if that comes up in conversation, tell me initially how you think about, given the compositions of your district, what, what do you say about this? I remember after the 2019 impeachment, the like first public event I did in the district, I had a couple of uh, like a husband and wife come up to me and say, uh, we're Republicans and, and I kind of geared up for, okay, this is gonna be the first kind of public conversation I have about that. And what they wanted to say was, we're always gonna vote for you because of how strongly you've stood by our labor union in the paper mill. Uh, one of them was going through a pretty rough and tumble kind of uh, you know, uh, negotiation and they appreciated how much I was on their side and on the worker's side. And so in the same way I was just talking about looking beyond party affiliation as a representative, they felt the same way as 
as, as voters, right? Um, what mattered to them was that I stood by them in, in their job. When you think about those particular voters who have the identity, how are you thinking of reaching them? I have many friends and acquaintances who are Trump supporters, and I sympathize with them. They're coming from a place of feeling very disadvantaged, feeling very disenfranchised and forgotten, and that is something I identify with. And, and if people have a certain feeling, then it's real. And I don't appreciate this feeling, I think, by folks who don't relate to Trump, that those aren't valid feelings. Yeah, I think Mary's pointing at something that's really important. It's like the Democrats for so long have just been obsessed with like facts and like numbers and trying to argue people out of their position and being smarter and more qualified. And, you know, and it's so offensive. Like <laughs> you can't use like fact, like if you don't, if you don't talk about people's like feelings like your facts are meaningless they, they point to nothing and i i think that's the critical thing like can you lift the hood up and talk about what's driving the sentiment and make it less personality focused and more community focused like every time that we make it about like a you know a person or like a celebrity like that that like we lose like that's not productive what are those things they you know when you go and talk about the 100 to the 100 people what are you making the assumptions on that we actually find more in agreement on than we disagree on? Like a sense that like I'm never going to earn as much money as my parents and the opportunity for me to like buy a home and have like a secure middle class life is slipping away and no one gives a damn. I'm not getting ahead. My neighbors aren't getting ahead. Our kids in this upcoming generation have a lot more headwind than we did in terms of interest rates and being able to buy a house and student debt and the whole nine yards. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's more of the same type of stuff. What, what comes to mind for me is uh, a lot of the traditional jobs and ways of, of making a living in, in Maine, whether it be small scale manufacturing or lumber, uh, you know, the fishing uh, trades in general in Maine, there's a sense that all that is going away and isn't a pathway to a successful future. Even if that's not the reality, I mean, I sometimes look at the trades in Maine Second District and view them as some of the best potential paying careers that you could have. But if you ask people, there's this underlying sense that it's all dying uh, and, and isn't, you know, a path to a, a good future. Democratic brand, talk to me about it. I mean, you mentioned it, but let how does it work to your advantage? Tell me the areas to the extent it helps and to the extent it hurts and why. So I, I would say two advantages are um, in Alaska, over 60% of our state is uh, for re women's reproductive rights. And that is um, an issue that the Democrats have taken the lead on and, and fully support. Um, another one is being pro-union. Alaska's mm -hmm. a third of our households are, are union households. We're a very pro-union state. I'm very fortunate. All the 100% of the unions in my state have backed me. I'm the only um, public servant who's had that um, kind of support, and I really appreciate it. But those are two good areas, as far as I'm concerned. You you feel like all of you, correct me if I'm wrong on that point, very briefly, if you talked about reproductive rights and being pro-union, each of your districts, we're talking majority plus voters. Yes? Yeah. Fair? Jerry, how, how about the um, Congressman, the, the, the issues of Democratic brand in your district? I think the brand is, is not great. Um, it's not great these days. Even among registered Democrats in my district, when you ask them to self-identify, we lose like you know a fifth of those actually registered in the party people don't act, they don't identify that way. Um, and they're, it's not that they're identifying with the other party; they're not identifying with with any party any longer, really. And I think that shows that the brand is weakening. Uh, we're losing them. It feels this is my own assessment but wondering about yours is that there's a cynicism of whether government can get anything done and to the extent that it does do things it institutes maybe some regulation that makes my job harder or it doesn't make rational sense to me of getting a certain thing accomplished that i need to get done but government itself broken cynical about it can it can it do anything at all and here you are as three members who who go to advocate you should believe in government there are things we can and should do for you but tell me how you wrestle with it. Well, first of all, impressions of people in your district around government, and what do you say to them about the role of it? I mean, I, 
I don't know if I would call it cynicism or just like realism. Like mm -hmm. it feels like a lot of policies are sort of targeted. Either you've got like basically regulatory capture at the upper end of the economic spectrum or you have like, you know, social supports at the bottom and then like nobody cares about the middle. And, you know, I think like legislation, um, you know, like a lot of it just like makes for good reading but doesn't fundamentally improve um, the well-being of our communities because uh, it has been sort of top down and, you know, the sort of brand of um, like both parties has generated, been generated in think tanks and not like a place-based politics. We've talked about the role of government. Let's turn that around. Tell me about how some of your constituents think about the role of corporate power. I think big government and big business is very much lumped together. And I think, um, you know, we, whenever there's, whenever these companies get bigger and bigger and more powerful, it, it only um, means bad things for, for people. And most of Alaskans, we feel like we're on the, in the hinterland, in the periphery, so it can only be bad for us, the, bi you know, the bigger these enterprises get. Yeah, I mean, like the desperate need for real campaign finance reform has become so clear to me now. And you see, like, who's got the money to lobby or to write these bills or to go out and, you know, get co-sponsors on legislation. And, and it's like these issues. I know if you if you went to the grocery store and like talk to people would have incredibly widespread support, um, near unanimous. But because of corporate capture, like you've seen this new form of currency organize around like getting legislation that supports you and like that's that is i think uh, another incredibly important element in, in my first term in congress i remember this one hearing in the small business committee where we were talking about um, kind of like right to know and labeling laws or labeling requirements that would tell you where your food comes from or what's in it uh, accurately, like you could depend on. And there was a lobbyist, or you know, we call him whatever you want, who was testifying and was explaining to me that consumers and Americans don't care about where their meat comes from or whether it was you know, raised in America and then sent to Mexico and like processed and then came back in and you know, is labeled or not or mislabeled. You know, he said, they don't care about any of that. All they care about is the cheapest food that they can possibly get in the grocery store. And that's just not my lived experience in Maine, and I'm pretty confident that's not where the majority of Mainers are. Like, they would like to know what they're buying and, yeah. and where it comes from and whether or not they can rely on its safety and if it's healthy or not. Zooming back out for a moment here, in order for the Democrats to win more races, they have to win in places that you guys carry. And it obviously, would extend the Democratic brand in the South, and uh, you know, in the the breadbasket of America, we have very few Democratic-held seats. Why aren't we winning there? What's your What's your suggestion of how to expand into these areas? I think we're not winning because we don't respect working people. And there's been just like hyper credentialing of who who we think makes a good candidate. We don't respect people that work. Like you've got to have like a JV, no kids, a trust fund. Like the party doesn't want to fundraise um, for you know somebody that doesn't have uh, a big network that can't go for th through their their phone book and like raise a hundred thousand dollars in twenty four hours. And so we are not putting forward candidates that understand how to talk about these issues and who take them personally. So I remember when I decided to run, the first thing, the first connection I ever had with the National Party was they wanted to send someone up to the district. And they came by my house and they sat down and they were like, let's Rolodex your phone contacts and assign a dollar you know, figure to each of these people to get a sense of how much money they thought I might be able to raise, and that was like priority number one for them, right? I do think that the, the National Party thinks too much uh, about you know, money, political connections, rather than saying like, let's go find the best person who's gonna really resonate with the community, and then build 
build the apparatus around them, right? I completely agree with that, and I think my situation mirrored that, yeah. Well, that's a, was a, one of the things that bonds you all. I mentioned that you were three of the five who have won in R plus districts. You are, correct me if I'm wrong, none of you have come from wealth, power, or privilege in your backgrounds. That's a fair fact. To say. Yes. <laughs> my, my definition, you're working class candidates, but you know many of your colleagues by this point, you know that a lot of them do come from places of power and privilege. You know, no disservice to them, but that's that's where that's how they got uh, an opportunity to get a seat. How do we get like the, you were starting to get into this? But how do we get when from your own experiences? people who want to sign up to actually run? There are people who are out there every day working on quality of life issues where they are. We need to find the people who have that clinical condition of public service and are of service. I think a lot of veterans um, fall into that category. I think a lot of working moms fall into that category. And it shouldn't just be people who can raise a lot of money from their contacts. Yeah, I think one structural reform that was really important, like Katie Porter got a bill passed that child care and elder care are an allowable campaign expense. And like, I could not have run without that because like, you know, so that those kinds of reforms are really important. Um, but I mean, I think that's part of the work we're doing now is like, you know, there's a candidate I really like. She's incredible. She is waiting tables at night to like pay for it. And then these fuckers in Congress are like, she doesn't have a real job. She's not a real kid. I'm like, oh, okay. Like, sir, you know, like service industry isn't a real job to you. You know, like it's so entrenched, just the callous disregard for work. You know, from my perspective, we, the opportunities to take an Alabama, you take a Tennessee, you have right now in Alabama just in the last few years, Amazon organizing campaign, Warrior Met Coal uh, workers on strike. We have Senate races up against, you know, Republicans aren't that amazing or popular, but yet, we can't seem to field, to your point, like a working class candidate. And you can't tell me that there aren't working class pools of people from whom to recruit and run. So I, I you know, I, I, when I try to have this conversation, I, I get a sense from too many working class people that they think, you know, it's not even worth it. You know, they, I just got no chance. And that means that it's on the party apparatus to feel like it has to go in and, and ask you to do something, to sign up and support you and take a long shot. Campbell. I would I would even be happy if we didn't um, do the recruiting. I would be happy if we would just be welcoming to the people who put themselves forward because I think that there is a disadvantage when you're asking or begging someone to run. There might be this expectation that they will have the funding provided for them or a lot of staff. No, it's it's a dog eat dog situation. But if somebody's brave enough to put themselves out there, I think the party should be willing to give real resources, not, you know, necessarily people from another state, um, you know, and that I think it happens in parties is they, they think that it's a resource sending you folks. And sometimes the folks that they send are more of a liability than, a, than an asset. Um, so I just, I wish we would support the folks who put themselves forward. Yeah. The first campaign manager I hired, he was, um, had no political experience other than right after he got out of the Navy, he volunteered to be the driver for uh, a former Democratic congressman who was running for governor. And so I hired him to be my campaign manager in a lot of like the kind of, you know, party, you know, pundits were saying like, Golden's got no clue what he's doing. He hired a, a you know, a driver uh, to run his campaign. I looked at that guy and said, he was a surface warfare officer, number two uh, on a ship and you know, with hundreds of sailors. Like, this is a detail-oriented person who's gonna be able to like cross T's and dot I's and manage a team so I can be focused on connecting with you know, my would-be constituents. It made all the sense in the world to me, but there was this like, deep skepticism that I didn't hire someone from the D trip. One of the obvious elephants in the room here around, a couple times you, you upset the Democratic constituency. Right, and certainly we'll, we'll talk about the student debt vote. Like, help me just understand from your perspective, right? People who got upset within a Democratic constituency, Biden voters say, hey, you know, here's old generation struggling with debt and he wants to cancel 20,000 for Pell Grants. So people under 125,000 is targeted. We're working class people. Why, why, why are we opposed to it? What, what's the concern? I want systemic reform. Like, why has the cost of tuition increased 431% since I was born? You know, like that's insane. Right now, 33% of people employed in higher ed are educators. Like a lot, there's like 7% of them are graphic designers. Like that's crazy. Like we're all getting taken along for this ride. 
and until we have a systemic, you know, uh, perspective on like, you know, like why why don't you know the elementary schools have air conditioning? It's like 85 degrees in the schools in my district. You know, like you can't learn like that. And and so we've eviscerated the public school. We've eviscerated you know um, trades programs. And and I think I think we're not asking the real questions that actually create a level playing field for people. I look at a lot of policies and um, ask like who is reaping the greatest benefit from this, and it is a question of limited resources in any Congress, right? Not just from a fiscal kind of responsibility standpoint, but just we know in any Congress, particularly with tight margins or divided government. You're only going to be able to do so much. So you got to really pick your priorities. And when I looked at the student debt forgiveness, I, it's kind of hard to argue that the way it was structured, it wouldn't have disproportionately gone to higher income, more affluent households. And so I think it's a bad priority uh, from that perspective. But the underlying problem I have with it too is is what do we value? Getting back to that conversation about people's hopes for the future and there's you know, skepticism in that future if they're in the trades or, or farming or, or even you know, working a, in a paper mill uh, as a steel worker. Um, I, I think it sent you know, a message that those things aren't our priorities. You know, these things are where the conversation taking place in Maine right now among a lot of, a lot of folks, um, a lot of teachers and people in the education spaces, is it even the right message to send that you have to go to college to be successful to begin with? Or in certain regions, are you actually setting folks up for failure because there is such a high cost that's always growing uh, and they're just going to end up with a lot of debt and maybe not a good connection with that local economy where they might want to have a shot to stay in a rural community and, and live there and be successful. But college in some ways can limit choice by saying like, well, in order to pay this back, you're gonna have to go somewhere else. But do you see it as a zero sum thing where you, you, know, you can't uh, do cancellation with expansion of let's say free community college or trades and can't, can't you do, could you do both? That's not what the administration put forward, right? So like maybe they should have thought about that yeah. first, right? And it also feels like nothing about us without us. Like you didn't talk to us, you don't think we're important. Like come back when you talk to us, you know? Let's say if it was a small business or a paycheck protection program or something like that, you would feel differently about a government having authority to do that kind of a cancellation or forgiveness plan? In this case, I would say it's an uneasy comparison, right? Everyone knew in Congress that the paycheck protection program was structured to be a grant. It was expected to be forgiven from the very beginning, assuming you met certain criteria, namely, first and foremost, keeping the people in your business employed and connected to their paycheck, even though you were shut down. So it's just not, it's not the same conversation, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I think there's also like fundamental differences, like nobody asked to be in a pandemic and be shut down. Like people made an economic choice because like the whole premise is that you're gonna make more money and everybody knows that is like one of the primary drivers of why people sign up for that debt because they know it's a bargain they're they're willing to make, you know. And when you and the reality is, when you look at people's wealth at retirement, people from the trades don't have the same level of wealth. It 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 in the, in the long run, like you made a bargain, and like that's the bargain you're making. And um, I mean, you know, PPP like getting abused is like, I mean, what, how much did the Lakers get? You know, like that pisses me off, you know. Yeah, there's a program, a, a bill that I like that would allow Pell Grants a little more flexibility in how you could use it. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could use a Pell Grant to go to an apprenticeship program, uh, as an example. Um, I think that would that would be one way to to get at this. And and then you could focus, you know, forgiveness more towards Pell Grant recipients, but make sure that it applies across okay. the board. Let's talk about Biden for a sec. Uh, advice to. As he runs for re-election, what's your advice to President Biden? He's asking you for it, let's assume, for now, <laughs> and says, what, what do I need to do in order to win? I think just get out and talk to people. He's very personable. I think two pieces of advice I would offer. The first would be to the people around him, which would be let Joe be Joe. Um, just be yourself uh, and connect with people. Uh, I hate it when I see like staff uh, trying to walk comments back or explain you know, what he meant uh, or didn't mean. 
um, just get out there and, and meet people face to face where they're at and, and be yourself. Uh, and that's when he's strongest. Um, and then like lean into the pro-labor policies and fights that this administration has been picking now for four years. He's been a very aggressive pro-labor president um, and, and he's got to lean into that and talk about it. And the industrial policy that they are trying to lay the foundation, you know, beginning with things like the infrastructure bill, you know, chips and science, um, you know, you gotta you gotta make the case to the American people directly about what those policies are gonna do, knowing that it's gonna take some years to actually see it come to fruition. People are smart, right? We always hear people say, "Well, those won't be implemented for years, and, and voters, you know, won't be able to appreciate what's coming around the corner." I mean, we gotta talk about our near-term successes. I think you gotta treat people with respect that they're smart. Go talk about the complexities of that industrial policy and the desire to bring manufacturing and make things here in America. Uh, like that's the stuff that I think is his his strongest platform and what he's accomplished and, and what he needs to keep talking to the American people about. My impression when I asked about the Biden question is that there's a lot of concern around cost of living. And you see it in a lot of polls that people are worried about. Things have gotten very expensive, price of various things out of reach. We go on forth with an economic message tied to cost of living, tied to where people are at. What are you trying to drive home here? What do you want to tell people who are situated with these concerns and where they're at? In the long run, I think a lot of that consumer perception of like, is like through uh, consolidation. I was in all these farm bill listening tours, talking to people in my community and my producers are like, there are two companies I can sell my chicken to. They control the price for feed, for fertilizer, for propane. Right. I have no power here. Right. You know, or, or there's no one that can transport my milk. Right. I'm up a creek. Okay, like not once does someone say antitrust, right. but that's what they're talking about. Right. And so we, you know, and, and it's a huge mistake when we make these things like big ideas, like it's the forest for the trees. Like you talk about specifically how people are getting screwed. I just think if people aren't un getting the message about the successes that we're making, about the good work we're doing, it's our fault. We're not doing a good job messaging. Um, so, um, and again, in plain spoken language, not political gibberish. There's a lot of focus right now on how do you message what's good about the economy that flies in the face of people's kind of lived experience with higher prices. and. I guess what I would, would say is make the case again, like respect people's intelligence that they can see the bigger picture. Like a lot of our economic problems are the result of decades of bad decisions, particularly in the space of, of like manufacturing and making things in America and, and good jobs. I'll go back to that example about, well, people just care about cheap goods. They don't care about what's actually, knowing what's in their food. Well, how many times do you hear someone say, all the American consumer cares about is access to cheap goods. Even if that means that something that used to be made in your community, that job's now been offshored to China or somewhere else. And you know who cares about the loss of livelihood in your community? Getting back to what I was saying about my advice to Biden talking about his you know, industrial policies is just make the long game case to the American people about wh how what he and what Democrats are doing today are going to help us turn around this economy for the better, but that it's going to take time. That was great. It's been a great conversation. Are there any lessons that we didn't glean from you that we should have, that I should have asked you about? Anything you want to say that I didn't touch on? In contestable districts, right, like districts that are either red or blue, but really either side could compete and, and win there. Um, you know, you've continued to draw focus to the ways in which the three of us are very um, focused on these local issues. Let's talk about the flip side of that. This is very anecdotal, but in 2020, the presidential race, and then also in Maine, we had like a, a Senate race that went over $100 million uh, spent. And I remember a lot of people telling me, we're watching this campaign through the lens of the advertisement battle, and they felt like none of it was about them, or even talking about things that mattered to them in their day-to-day -day life. And that left them feeling like empty inside, and like they were invisible. It's like, 
you know, I'm being asked to make a choice about who's going to be the leader of our nation and who's going to be, you know, our next senator. And the hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent in these advertisement wars, and none of it means much to me at all. It really makes people feel awful uh, and very, I think, cynical and skeptical about democracy. Um, so it's not just that we're fixated on local issues and people like that. It's that when they look at the broader, you know, kind of campaign apparatus and these two national parties warring it out often about issues that um, seem rather obscure and meaningless to, to people and make them feel like what matters to them and, and what they're struggling with day to day, Washington doesn't care about that. I wanted to ask you, I would, I would, what have you been, your experiences? You've only been here for, two, how long has it been now? A year, yeah. a year plus? Give me, you've mentioned a couple of them, lessons so far. You know, for those who, who don't live in politics, right? You're, it's still new, what the lobbying scene, how money gets raised, this town, Give me, give me some early feedback here. I mean, it, it is it is crazy here. I mean, it's crazy. Like, and I see the way that like people, you know, you, you've got a team around you that tries to like take friction out of your life, but then you're like, like I had my, I, I lost my wallet and like had to replace my driver's license and like probably shouldn't say this on TV or whatever, but like they got stolen. My driver's license got stolen. And then you're like in this quagmire with like, the DOL trying to figure out where the hell my license is and like you know if you've got a staff that like handles that kind of thing for you like the friction in your life doesn't mirror the friction in everybody else's life and you see how people sort of get led down this path of um, comfort and like feeling important without understanding that like being unimportant is one of the most valuable things you could have in evaluating policy. One of the shocking things to me getting here is how separated both of the parties are. Um, just, just in physical distance, how segregated within the house we are. We eat in separate places. I've only had a couple occasions to really dine with Republicans, have a, a nice dinner, and it was awesome. It was lovely. It was one of the best dinners I've had. Um, but our cloakrooms are different. Um, a lot of people you know, you can see, I, we all come in like different entrances because we congregate on different sides um, of literally the aisle. But, um, and, and in committee rooms, we're set up opposed to each other. We don't sit next to each other in subcommittees. I mean, it is really designed to be segregated and I would love to see that change. I think the longer I'm here, the, the more my um, instincts um, tell me, I guess, exactly that, which is, you know, trust my instincts. Um, I grew up in my community. I'm I'm rooted there, and and um, you know you can't go out and poll every little thing. But I, I generally feel like when I follow my instincts about what's best for the community, and also what what do um, what do I you know think my constituents feel about an issue. Um, that's better than any poll or any advice that you'll get from your colleagues or or even from a you know, um, you know, some kind of expert in politics or, or something along those lines. Folks thought when I voted against Build Back Better that um, I would not be able to explain the complexities of my thinking around that vote, right? I went out there and went on a blitz in Maine to explain to my constituents, including Dem voters, who some of whom were upset, like, here's why I don't think this is the right set of policies today, right? And, and, I, and I really went hard against SALT, if you remember that. It's like the biggest line item expenditure in, in the House version of that bill. Another, I guess, example is like a lot of times I sometimes lean into local issues or like state politics issues and, and like the advice is stay out of that. You don't have to get in, involved. Um, so as an example, I'm the first elected official in my lifetime to come out in support of tribal sovereignty for the tribes in Maine. And a lot of people are like, no, no, like elected officials at the federal level never weigh in on a local issue. It's, you know, just stay out of that fight and, and stay clean. But I felt really strongly in my heart that it's the right thing. And so I've, I really leaned into that. I just think too many people come here and they, they follow too much of the advice that's being thrown at them um, from like the political machine rather than just trusting what they already know about themselves and about their communities. Thank you for this wonderful conversation. Appreciate you making the time. All right. Fun. Great.
Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe to see more videos like this one. And if you ever have any ideas for what More Perfect Union should cover next, please drop them in the comments. Thanks.